Hi, everybody. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing a real star. <laughs> oh, on the left there, you see Mike Gerber, the real star, <laughs> with one of his graduate students and a celebrity. I don't know how you got Who's this. Who's a celebrity? Mike. Sorry. <laughs> Mike, the real star, right? Yeah. Anyhow, it's a real pleasure to have Mike here. It's the first time he's talked at, EV, uh, at the Ecology and Evolution Seminar Series. Uh, Mike was an undergrad at Penn State, and then he was a graduate student at UNM, and now he's a professor at Santa Barbara at the um, Integrative Anthropological Science Program, I think they've renamed themselves. Uh, Mike has done field work both um, in Paraguay with the Ache and in Bolivia with the Simani, and I hear from his students that he is, of everybody in that team, and it's a huge team, he is by far the best Simani speaker. He also apparently knows every one of all the adults who live in 22 different <coughs> villages across Simani land, so they're all completely amazed by his abilities. Mike made his name um, early on working on issues of cooperation and food sharing, and probably many of you here don't know, but in band societies, it's very common for successful hunters to come back and give away the vast majority of their food uh, to families who are not necessarily related to them. And so this became, um, if from Mike's very detailed work, um, he was able to rule out hypotheses of necessarily uh, hi uh, kin selection, also costly signaling and really got us thinking about the dynamics of why food is shared uh, way beyond the kinship group. And this has uh, led to really the, the flourishing of literature that we see on models of cooperation, large-scale cooperation beyond kin groups um, that we read about all over the place. In many ways, was stimulated by the uh, really careful, painstaking, beautiful analysis that were done by uh, Mike and his colleagues in the Ache and Simani study sites. Today, however, um, he's going to talk about uh, a different string to his bow, and probably in Mike's case, this is not just a, an analogy. I suspect that Mike is probably the only person in this room who I'm sure has a bow and arrow somewhere tucked away as a result of his field work. Um, and this is his work on life history, demography, and health. And um, this is a big project that he's the joint director of uh, with Hilly Kaplan on the Somali, it's called the Somali Life History Project, funded by NIH, by NIA, by NSF, and they have numerous students and um, postdocs working for them. And he's going to talk about some of this work today, senescence. work on the evolution of human senescence. And finally, we took uh, Mike to the circus in Winters yesterday, and we saw fabulous stuff with people swinging all over the a big tent and the big top and doing all these wonderful tricks. And so, um, Mike, we're expecting as much of you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, that's, that's the Bolivian Michael Jackson. Uh, I figure, yeah, Monique told me yesterday that after seeing the circus that my talk has to be better than the, the equivalent of, what was it, the spinning satellite move, you know, with the hang this cord attached to the, the high wire and spinning around many, many times, but I might be able to break out a moonwalk if necessary, uh, <laughs> but okay. This is another reason why Facebook is dangerous. Uh, oh, that you inserted that in there. Oh, that's going to be filmed, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so, is age just a number? Uh, basically, you just look at these pictures. I could pick any assortment of pictures, and you can try to guess somebody's age. And oftentimes you're right, many times you're wrong. This, for example, is Walt Whitman. Uh, how old does he look? He looks 70s. Looks 70s. I bet he was 50s, though. 42. Yeah. Yeah, so 42. Uh, and these folks are some Chimane that are uh, in their uh, 71. The guy's 71, and she's 73. Um, and so 
there's a lot of variability just when you look at somebody, uh, but getting more precise, you can pick your favorite biomarker, measure it over time, and you can get these individual slopes. And you can see there's a whole lot of action. Uh, this was a study done in Japan over 10 years. And you know, yeah, there's an increasing slope with age, but within each of these age categories, there's a lot of the variability. And trying to understand the variability is, is something I want to try to talk about today. And part of my take, most of the work done on humans and looking at aging is done at national level, developed societies, um, where you measure a whole bunch of biomarkers on people, and maybe you follow up a year, five to five years later, uh, measure biomarkers again, see who lives, who dies. And so looking at this in the small scale society context has never really been done uh, extensively. And so trying to get a window into what health and aging might look like uh, our best bet is to look in some of these societies that mirror some of the conditions of our ancestral past. So the, the short answer, how long do humans live under traditional conditions, uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's, I believe it's the 70s, about seven decades, uh, and I can show you a little bit of information to support that. If we take all the data that exists on exit hunter-gatherer populations, where careful demographic uh, methods have been applied to try to age people. And you can take some of that data, make some life tables, and try to look at how long people live. And so this isn't an unbiased sample by any means, because you can only use the data that exists and that have been actively studied. So many more are in South America than in other places. We don't have anything really from North America. Uh, but if you look at, as a whole in all these societies where you, you didn't have medical attention, you didn't have supermarkets, uh, you didn't have any other amenities of modern life, and you get a similar pattern. This is the modal age of death. So saying you survived to age 15, just look at the frequency distribution of deaths. And what you tend to find is around the, the seventh decade of life, there is a mode here. So that most people are, the majority of deaths are focused in that area. Now, if you look at that yellow curve, that was actually the US from 2002. And so more developed societies today, you see about a decade uh, difference. Uh, so that this, this modal age of death seems shifted about 10 years or so. Now, interestingly, whether you look at hunter-gatherers, whether you look at uh, forager farmers, so people living like hunter-gatherers, but also doing some slash and burn uh, horticulture, uh, or hunter-gatherers that have acculturated, or you can take uh, our European data, the oldest data that exists from 1751, uh, and they pretty much overlap quite a bit. I mean, there's a little bit of variability, but for the most part, they've shown similar patterns of about seven decades, even though they're living under very different conditions. And so if we contrast uh, a hunter-gatherer, so taking the average of all our hunter-gatherer groups, a uh, hunter-gatherer mortality profile uh, would say really good conditions like say the US in 2004 and we can just take the ratio and what you see is well first of all the, the life expectancy at birth being about in the low 30s for hunter-gatherers and say 78 for the US most of you probably know this already but it doesn't mean that everyone lives at 32 and then dies uh, infant and child mortality is very high and so that average is a bit deceiving in terms of thinking about lifespan when we really think about how long do people can they live and so if you look at that ratio you can see there's a huge difference early in life so that uh, infants are about 200 times more likely to die if they're a hunter-gatherer and it drops down pretty rapidly so that by age 15 a hunter-gatherer is about 14 times more likely to die than an American by age 45 that number drops down to 7 and then by 65, it's still substantial, but much reduced, only three times more likely. So that there is somewhat of a convergence towards uh, almost a fixed pattern built into the life course. And so I'm going to be going a little bit quickly because I'm excited to show you some new stuff. Uh, so my preliminary conclusion, that we're only giving three slides, uh, post reproductive longevity seems to be a robust feature uh, of extant and presumably past hunter-gatherers. And not everyone believed that. This was kind of countering the idea that only in the past 150 years or so, since the advent of modern medicine, cleaning up the water supply, et cetera, have humans lived to fairly long lives. Uh, life expectancies for modern forager and presumably ancestral populations are low, mostly due to very high infant child mortality. 
Most survival improvements with acculturation occur at young and early adult ages. Age-specific life expectancies tend to converge at older ages. Uh, modal ages of adult deaths for hunter-gatherers is in about seven decades long. So all this is showing kind of convergent evidence of some kind of uh, lifespan that is built into the, the, the human adaptive pattern. Uh, I didn't really get into this, we can get into it in Q&A. Paleodemographic estimates that often show low child and really high adult mortality for early humans. It doesn't match any modern pattern and every couple of years there's a new version of some of these old life tables and they're starting to look more and more like the, uh, the life tables coming out of the ethnographic cases of the hunter-gatherers like I showed here. All right, so moving, oh, I don't know what happened to that. Uh, anyway, uh, has the rate of aging itself changed over the course of human history? Well, our ability to do this without a time machine is really, uh, it's really difficult, but we can make some loose inferences just based on looking at mortality. And so that's why I call it actuarial aging as opposed to what you might get by looking at actual physiology. Uh, and you can loosely define it as some rate of mortality increase in a population. Uh, there's different ways of operationalizing it. Uh, some really strict ways, like the, the rate that mortality doubles uh, with age. Uh, you can look at the slope of the mortality curve at a certain point. Uh, Robert Rickliffs has come up with another measure that basically just uses some of these uh, components from an exponentially increasing part of the mortality function. Now the part here that just to emphasize is we can decouple uh, what's called extrinsic mortality, loosely here we can call that the age independent component of mortality, uh, separate that from what we can call senescent mortality, which is that age dependent, the increasing part of mortality later in life. And so we can make a general hypothesis uh, that George Williams uh, stated uh, back in the 50s that greater extrinsic mortality should associate with a higher rate of senescence. And it makes sense if all else equals, I learned this morning, if you're in Malawi and you're likely to get hit by, uh, by lightning, so you might not plan too much for the future, and so why invest in a soma that's going to last a really long time if chances are you're not going to be around to, to reap whatever benefits of, of later life there might be. So you might expect there to be a positive relationship there. Uh, empirical support is somewhat mixed. Uh, across different um, species of mammals. Uh, the theoretical prediction has some limitations. Uh, it's, this has never been tested with humans. And what I want to just talk about briefly right now, um, the forager stuff is a little bit, uh, there's some controversy there. And so I'm not going to get into it right now, but I'll look at a cleaner data set, which is looking at, uh, let's just take Sweden, where I said we had our earliest uh, mortality data on Sweden. So if we look back into the 1750s up till, these are cohorts, uh, up until the 1900s, we can separate out that age-independent mortality from the increasing mortality. And so here I have two of these aging measures, that mortality rate doubling time, and, and W, which is a, a, the, the Rickliffe's measure. Uh, it doesn't, the important point is to know that if it's higher, that means higher rate of aging, whereas the mortality rate doubling time, if it's higher, that means slower aging because it's taking longer for the mortality rate to double. And M0 here is that extrinsic mortality rate. So it's a little bit hairy in the early period here. Uh, this is you know, the age of pestilence and famine, uh, according to Amran, but it's also the case where the data are, are shoddier. Uh, but you can see beyond that into the 1800s, 1900s, the extrinsic mortality is declining pretty systematically amongst men and women. But what's harder to see and what's a little bit more robust is that the, the mortality rate doubling time isn't changing so much and that if anything it's actually declining at late ages or in later cohorts which would suggest faster aging whereas this other measure is showing uh, slower aging. So depending on which measure you use you get a somewhat different kind of outcome. So we're somewhat limited by what we can say when we focus on mortality and it gets it gets caught in these debates about what's the appropriate measure to use, what's the appropriate statistical model to use, and so ultimately what we want to get at, we can't really get at, I think, just focusing on mortality. Now you can do the correlation, and when you do it, between extrinsic mortality rate and a rate of aging, you do tend to find 
Uh, this was Sweden, and also I did it in England and Wales, where uh, cohort data exists for a couple centuries. And you get a positive correlation uh, for a couple of these measures, not for the mortality rate doubling time, which I think is more species specific. It's a more rigid kind of measure because it's completely independent of any mortality rate because it's just how many years before the mortality rate doubles. Uh, and so there's a positive correlation, but I don't think that is necessarily uh, evidence for actual evolution. So I'll get to that in a minute. It's the last point on my conclusions part two. Uh, saying actuarial aging rates are similar amongst hunter-gatherers and some of our earliest data we have on European samples, so the Sweden and England. Aging appears to have slowed, uh, but not uniformly over the past several centuries, uh, and it has slowed somewhat in sync with declining extrinsic mortality, but to argue that selection has occurred over just ten generations uh, is, is somewhat speculative. Um, People seem to reach similar level of senescent mortality about 10 years later now compared with recent past. Uh, based on this mortality data, the aging rates in men are somewhat faster than among women. And that I didn't show it, but that's true also in the subsistence populations. Uh, so consistent with an argument made by Tim Kluttenbrock and colleagues about the more slightly more polygynous societies, you see greater differences in uh, mortality rates. Um, between males and females and, and lifespan. Uh, but the empirical measures and the analytical methods do matter. Um, and finally, so as I mentioned, no evidence of selection per se, but what this does indicate, now taking this at the individual level, that the kinds of changes that are lowering extrinsic mortality do have uh, implications at the individual level for later aging when individuals within those cohorts so for example, if you eliminate uh, pathogens and you can immunize people, so you're essentially lowering extrinsic mortality, and those individuals, when they become uh, much older, uh, potentially could be much, in much better condition and could potentially age much uh, more slowly. But there's going to be some kind of limits. And so this, this plays into big questions about, you know, uh, even though life expectancy is increasing fairly linearly, uh, is that linear increase in life expectancy going to continue for much longer. Um, okay, so that ends, I think, the first part where I focus mostly on the demographic perspectives on longevity, and now I want to get into some of the aspects that are uh, based on some of the, the field research to ask, you know, what does health and aging look like in a traditional population? Uh, and mostly here what I'm going to focus on, how does exposure to infections, viruses, and parasites shape investments in growth and immune function so early in life, and then ultimately uh, immunosenescence, uh, the ability to repair uh, damaged cells, et cetera, over the life course. And so then what will be the consequence of this lifelong assault uh, on the body um, in terms of your frailty, your disability, morbidity, and ultimately mortality. Okay, so this is, as Monique said, uh, for about a decade now, working in, conju in conjoint with, with Hilly Kaplan uh, and, and colleagues at the University of New Mexico, this project within Bolivia trying to get a uh, real deep insight in one society with the, the idea down the road to, to be able to create an exportable package that we can then look at aging in different societies that vary in fundamental ways. Uh, so populations that vary in their diet, in their activity level, in their pathogen exposure, et cetera, and then be able to compare across certain metrics uh, to look at what the implications are for aging. So just in case, I'll go through quickly in case you're not familiar with the, the field site. This is in central lowland Bolivia. Uh, most Chimane villages live along this Maniki River, so it's a very fishing-based uh, population. All Chimane pretty much learn how to fish and actively fish. Uh, they do have high omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, by the way. It was, uh, we just looked at that in milk uh, this past year. And so uh, heavy fish input in the diet. Uh, hunting as well is very important. All the classic neotropical mammals, uh, Chimane hunt. So the tapir, for example, armadillo, collared peccary, 
uh, the various species of monkeys. This is a Kwati Mundi and uh, 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 colored anteater at the top. The bulk of the calories, though, the two thirds of the calories are actually coming from people's fields. So sweet manioc that's that's made into fermented beverage, uh, paya, plantains are the big staple, uh, and then more recently some rice uh, and corn is also used in conjunction with uh, sweet manioc to make uh, chicha, the fermented beer. Uh, most of production and distribution occurs within the context of, of nuclear families and extended families, groups of families living together in clusters. And so life is very social. People depend on each other for many different things, uh, not just for, for producing food and distributing food, but also taking care of each other during illness. Um, and so this, this is, was kind of the transition from studying sharing and how people deal with risk to understanding bigger questions about uh, how the ability to deal with risk on longer time scales uh, is kind of an inherent part of the human life history and, and how that actually plays out in practice. And so, for example, uh, many of you probably read uh, Sarah's book uh, and, and she's talked a lot about cooperative breeding in humans and so here, uh, just you know, illustrate, yes, with every child, you've got mothers, you've got grandmothers, you've got aunts, you've got fathers, you've got older daughters, lots of individuals that are directly taking care of children uh, and feeding them and protecting them, etc. And over the course of the past 10 years, uh, I've had a, a biomedical project that kind of goes along with a lot of the anthropological work that go does detailed medical histories of of pretty much every Chimani that we've encountered. So saying I know everyone in 22 villages, we're now working in 85 villages. Uh, I don't know very many people in those other 60 villages. Um, but we do much more extensive stuff with people that are, our old category is 40 and up. Uh, so you can imagine, because people say, why do you work with the Chimani? You know, aren't there you know, hunter-gatherers that are more isolated? There are, there's not that many. Uh, but the few that are might have maybe one or two people who are over the age of 60. So you're fairly limited by what you can actually um, do in a population like that. And certainly when you're list looking at the mortality profiles, uh, just by adding a little bit of uh, slash and burn doesn't seem to change the overall mortality profile uh, from hunter-gatherers a whole lot. So. Uh, certainly there are real differences, I think, with adding horticulture to the diet and being a little bit more sedentary uh, that we can get into in, in the, in the Q&A. But uh, to get a decent enough sample size uh, to study uh, aging in older populations, you need to have a population that's you know, minimally several thousand uh, to study it. And so just kind of a picture to show you what it's like setting up labs in the field. It's, it's dreadful. Uh, very difficult, um, but there's still quite a bit you can do um, with you know truck batteries and uh, liquid nitrogen tanks and uh, etc. So the, a summary here of, of the kind of ecology: Ch Chimani inhabit a very highly infectious environment. You know, on any particular uh, random visit, uh, about eight out of ten. Chimani will have some type of intestinal helminth, so ascarit if you're interested in the types. It's mostly hookworm, uh, roundworm, some whipworm, so the trichorous. Uh, three out of ten or so might have a respiratory infection, uh, less so some gastrointestinal infection, uh, and some skin fungal infections. And with this high level of infectious exposure, uh, under these high infection conditions, Having a strong immune function, immune defense, you can imagine would be uh, obviously selected for. And so having a strong acute phase, so your innate inflammatory response uh, would be particularly selected for. Uh, and yet in inflammation, as I'll soon talk about, is implicated uh, in most diseases, uh, chronic diseases at late ages. So it's one of those pot potentially pleiotropic things where uh, what can benefit you early in life and therefore is actively selected can come back to haunt you later in life. So in a simple 
very simplified schematic of life history trade-offs. So you can have a total budget that you're allocating to your multiple uh, functions of maintenance, reproduction, growth, and development. Uh, you can go further with reproduction and growth and development. But what I want to go with is the maintenance aspect, the immune defense and repair. And particularly with the immune defense, oftentimes we tend to think about you know, more investment in immune function versus less. And of course, the more you look into immune function, the more complicated the picture is. And there's certainly very different ways that you can invest in immune function. So innate or nonspecific defenses versus adaptive immunity, so the cell-mediated antigen-specific type uh, of immune defenses and, and the humoral defenses. So these are your antibodies uh, in particular that are uh, determined by your, your B cell lymphocytes. And so yes, you can go even further into your CD4, so your, your helper C T cells versus your cytotoxic T cells. Uh, and so these are our, our, our two main arms of the immune def uh, of your adaptive immune function, the Th2 versus the Th1. And Th1 you can just think of as your intracellular defenses, so against viruses and bacteria, for example, whereas your Th2, this is your allergies and your helmets, so your worms. And so in populations that are heavily parasitized by macroparasites, you would expect them to be somewhat Th2 biased. Uh, in your B cells, all your, your antibodies, and I'm going to be talking about IgE, so immunoglobulin E, these are, this is the one particularly implicated in defense against uh, worms. So now I want to kind of lay out different ways that I think pathogen exposure are impacting the life course. And so by looking at a population that has fairly heavy uh, uh, burden of parasites. And so rather than just go leaping right for the aging part, I want to show how investment uh, to kind of protect against uh, you know, massive damage from parasites, how it's costly early in life when we see trade-offs with, uh, with growth. And so, and not just focusing on the, the short stature of these populations, uh, which is one potentially you know, obvious outcome, but we can go further than that. So IgEs are immunoglobulin level E, so the one I said that is implicated in, in defense against uh, macro parasites, particularly helminths, and so N. Haynes is a is a U.S. study, and so the the Chimane have levels of IgE that's about like 160 times greater than N. Haynes. So if you went to a hospital and they saw this on a readout, you know they would probably freak out. It's really really high. So even the Shuar, which is another group, uh, they're in Ecuador, uh, also in the Amazon, but a little bit more acculturated, some more access to modern medicine. They have pretty high IgE too, but it's it's you know about six times lower than what the Chimane levels are. So what's the cost, the implications of having such high levels of IgE early in life? Well, what we can what we did uh, this is with Aaron Blackwell, who's currently postdocing with me, was we just looked at the age profile of uh, onset of the levels of IgE. This is on a logarithmic scale. And so you can see it's much lower in the, in the U.S. sample than there's the Schwar and there's the Chimane. And the Chimane, so let's, let's see, put, yeah, the little line there. That, so the peak age is earliest in the population that has the highest level of exposure, as you might expect. You want to get those defenses up as quickly as possible. And then we see, so it's about age 7 in Chimane, then about age 10 in the Schwar, and at about age 17, uh, in the U.S. And so the earliest kind of peak uh, in the population with the highest uh, level of exposure, this has been referred to as the peak shift um, in, in when immune defenses are, well actually it hasn't really been applied to immune defenses, it's been applied mostly to just peak burden of different parasites. And so we can actually look, well what's the age profile of actually having parasites? Does it actually match this kind of increase in uh, the, the antibody investment. And so what you can see is around that age 7 to 8 or so, so up at the top that was the, the IgE, so the antibody uh, levels, and then here is hookworm, roundworm, threadworm, and anyworm. And for the most part, it's, they're, they're pretty similar. Some of them are right on, like roundworm and threadworm, 
Uh, whereas hookworm actually seems to increase in prevalence uh, across the lifespan uh, as opposed to having this early peak which other parasites tend to have. But for the most part, there's a lot of exposure early on and so there's strong reason to be able to prime those defenses earlier rather than later. And so then, what we can do then is look at trade-offs with growth. So certainly if you just look at absolute amount of kilos added per year or, or centimeters of height per year, you get obvious differences between the U.S. and the Chimane and the Schwar, uh, which I, I won't even show, but I'll just tell you that they match you know, the kind of ordered level of uh, pathogen exposure. But we can take it further and just say normalize <coughs> to what adult height levels are. This is looking at height velocities. Can we say that, uh, so there's the, so these are um, our U.S. curves, height velocity for males and females uh, separated out, but we can kind of, for Mexican American, uh, whites and African Americans, but overall just as, as a baseline. And we add the Schwar, and they, during the period of um, when all this IgE investment is going on, there's reduced growth uh, velocity, even when these are normalized. So there's a lot of flexibility within you know, the, the pre-adult uh, growth trajectories. And so uh, looking at variations in the shape, so are there dips during the period where you expect all this early in, uh, immune investment uh, and then catch up growth later on. And so there's with the Chimane where you have even lower uh, growth velocities. Uh, you can see it a little bit better in the, in the females here. Uh, these are just kind of schematics. The statistical tests have been done and, and show that there's a, a significant difference in the age ranges where you have the peak investment in these antibodies. So there's real cost to this. All right, so now, taking a somewhat different direction, uh, looking at the effects of parasites and trying to implicate them in something that seems a little bit irrelevant to parasites, but it, namely cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to talk about potential roles that are implicated in uh, levels of cholesterol, levels of obesity, and atherosclerosis. So the Chimane, on many levels, have very few obvious risk factors. So this is the prevalence of obesity, you know, your BMI greater than 30, and here's your total cholesterol uh, being really high, so higher than 240. And if you look at the Chimane, it's fairly low prevalence of obesity and high cholesterol. They're pretty much flat across the board. Uh, they increase a little bit with age, but not a whole lot. And uh, certainly nothing compared to, say, the US populations here, where about a third are obese uh, by the time you hit your, your, your 40s here and then a quarter have really high cholesterol. And so what we found was, I mean, we did have some ideas about why uh, parasites might be related to cholesterol. Parasites are known to alter host uh, metabolism of lipids. Uh, they're also known to alter, potentially regulate certain antibodies uh, that act against cholesterol. And so, I mean, a, a quarter of a LDL, their bad cholesterol, the turnover, uh, is related to these um, antibodies that, uh, that parasites are, are altering. And so what we did was look at uh, the extent to which individuals had parasites and also indications, indicators of parasites. In some ways, the IgE level is actually, it's more long-term than taking a single fecal sample and seeing whether you have parasites. Because uh, also the gold standard for doing fecal analysis is a series of several samples and uh, due to logistics we only were able to take one sample. So looking at uh, IgE and looking at eosinophils, so these are your, your, your white blood cell components that are also implicated in, in defense against parasites. And what we saw was people that had higher levels of eosinophils, uh, IgE, uh, two other measures of inflammation, so they're not necessarily directly related to um, worms per se, but other types of infections uh, also showed, uh, these were in the predicted direction, but they weren't all significant, but showed lower levels of total cholesterol. So people with high IgEs, this was like a top quartile of IgE, 
had about 20 points lower, almost 20 points lower in cholesterol. Eosinophils had about, uh, depending on how you define this, was the, the fourth quartile, also had uh, just um, about seven uh, points lower in their cholesterol. And so this was pretty suggestive because the effect was similar magnitude of the things that you would expect to matter, like BMI, for example, uh, or, or sex differences, which are commonly touted. So that was one kind of effect. And then the other effect is, uh, in looking at cardiovascular disease, uh, about half of uh, heart attacks, for example, occur amongst people who have you know, fairly normal levels of cholesterol. And so what, you know, you go to your doctor and if you have any risk factors, they might do a C-reactive protein test. So even if you're on the high end of normal, that, that uh, is predictive of, uh, of cardiovascular events later in life. And so uh, the idea is that inflammation itself is implicated. So this is your innate response that we said was be very adaptive in high pathogen environments, but inflammation is implicated in all stages of atherosclerosis. And so any marker of inflammation tends to be fairly predictive of cardiovascular events uh, and stroke events. And these aren't just predictors. It's a little bit controversial, but there's good evidence that they're actually causally implicated in the process, not just indicators of something else. And so what you'd, ought, you'd expect is that in an infectious environment like in the Chimani environment, that you would have high indicators of these inflama inflammatory markers. Uh, so, so just taking the one popular case here is C-reactive protein. And so by age, in the U.S. at least, by your teenage years, 15% uh, of North Americans already show signs of early coronary atherosclerosis. Uh, by the time you hit 60, majority of Westerners have fully developed atherosclerosis. In fact, it's so common that atherosclerosis is pretty much has been defined as a normal part of aging in all parts of the modern world. There was just a study that came out, uh, get the journal. Uh, it was the biggest collection organized of 53 uh, Egyptian mummies that were analyzed by seven different cardiologists and at least half showed signs of probable if not definite atherosclerosis. Again, taken as evidence that this is a fairly uh, universal aspect of aging. And so when you certainly, when you look at another, at the C-reactive protein, if you again look at, say, the Chimane and a couple other populations, Here's our U.S. here, and the Schwar, and then Italy, just because we had the data. And yeah, at all ages, for the most part, Chimani show higher levels of C-reactive protein. So higher exposure, as you would expect, leading to higher levels of an inflammatory response and chronic exposure to inflammation. So the first step we took to try to look at what the implications would be uh, we, we expected what, we, what was shown with Civil War recruits uh, based on Fogel and Costa's data where they argued that higher exposure to infectious disease was associated with an earlier and higher, a greater rate of onset, uh, earlier onset and greater prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Um, and so what we did was looked at peripheral arterial disease, so basically atherosclerosis but in your limbs. And the easiest way you can get at that is what's called the ankle brachial index. And this is basically doing blood pressure, but uh, a little fancier using a, a Doppler to, to make it more precise. And it's looking at differential blood pressure in the ankle, uh, in the tibial arteries, and in the brachial arteries. And as you can imagine, if there's blockage going on, then there should be a difference in the blood pressure. And the standard is anything less than 0.9 is indicative of peripheral arterial disease. And so by now we've actually done this with over like 500 adults over the age of 40. And, and what we found, here's our 0.9, uh, and not a single Chimane so far is under the, the, the 0.9 marker. And this hasn't been observed anywhere. So any, any population where it's been looked at, not only do you see some positive prevalence, but it's also fairly steeply increasing with age. So this is our first indication that, wow, maybe atherosclerosis doesn't exist. But, you know, this isn't a gold standard. It's a, certainly an indication. So we tried to go the next step, and we're in the middle of this right now. This is getting a portable ultrasound machine and doing uh, B-mode ultrasonography of the 
uh, into the media layer of the carotid artery. And so you can actually look directly at the presence of arterial plaques, and you can also look at the thickness of the intima media layer of, of the arteries to see, in a more kind of gold standard kind of way, whether there is uh, evidence of atherosclerosis. And so far, we haven't seen much evidence of plaques. This is really preliminary because we've only had about 10 samples analyzed because it costs like $150 to analyze. Uh, one sample because they do like 95 measurements along this artery and I'm um, trying to work around that to do that um, more cheaply but the the picture is getting a little more complicated because it I mean there's different methods in different populations but what we can see at least the thing I would just say from this is that the Chimani don't look terribly different from other populations this I think is all US with different ethnic groups uh, it seems, there seems to be potentially age-related thickening, uh, and it doesn't look terribly different from other populations, and given the small sample sizes, uh, at least it seems that, just by this, that maybe Chimani aren't terribly different. But then it raises the question, how can you have some types of arterial aging without the manifestation of actual full-blown atherosclerosis, plaque disrupture that leads to uh, the, the kind of coronary and stroke cerebrovascular events that we're so familiar with. So to go, that's kind of an open question. I don't have the, 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 the answer yet for that. Uh, the next stage is we're actually going to do some pulse wave velocity to get at the elasticity of the arteries uh, and to also get at um, uh, some, some other measures that allow you to look at uh, cardiac function and uh, different properties of arteries to really be able to see uh, what aspects of vascular aging seem universal and which ones do not. And so this, I actually wanted to put this in here because this just came out a couple weeks ago in, in a science article. It was done mostly with, with mice, but it was actually showing that eosinophils, and particularly because of uh, parasite uh, introducing parasites uh, into these mice, uh, eosinophils were the things that uh, the white blood cell components that were implicated in uh, the regulation of a, a certain cytokine called interleukine 4 which was regulating the types of uh, macrophages so the immune cell components that essentially were downstream regulating metabolism and so they, in a really kind of nice experimental method we're tying the presence of eosinophils with glucose regulation and uh, metabolism, uh, overall homeostasis of metabolism, and it was through actual the regulatory T cells. So basically it was balancing the Th2 and the Th1 arms of the immune system in ways that have implications for metabolism because fat cells, uh, adipose cells, uh, have lots of macrophages and immune cell components and so with, without the presence of eosinophils, you get dysregulation. And so they were able to show that you had the wrong type of immune cell components dominating in the absence of parasites, uh, and that led to uh, glucose intolerance, metabolic syndrome, basically, and uh, overabundance of the wrong type of immune cell components, basically the pro-inflammatory components. And so this was really interesting. So of course I ran to, to take a look and again, this is also preliminary, but uh, eosinophils, just to give you a sense, uh, if you, uh, your white blood cells, probably most likely less than 5% of your white blood cells are eosinophils. Uh, the Chimane average is about 18% of their eosinophils are, are white blood cells. And so uh, when you compare uh, to obese adults, the eosinophils are about 6% higher uh, in, in thin Chimane. So that 6% is already greater than all you know, the US level. Uh, and there's a graded effect. So it's 1.6% higher in overweight Chimane, 3% higher in normal Chimane, uh, normal by, by BMI. So just to show you what the, that looks like based on the regression equations, uh, here's our thin individuals, normal based on uh, BMI, overweight, and obese. And this is in higher and lower pathogen environments uh, amongst the Chimane, so the individuals living closer to town across the board have lower eosinophils, but you still see this kind of graded effect, so that uh, the thinner individuals have the highest eosinophils. And so 
the next step is to take a look at the more proximate pathways to see if this isn't just some spurious correlation, but if there's some deeper way in which parasites are helping to regulate metabolism uh, in ways that don't lead to the kinds of downstream metabolic syndrome, glucose, uh, 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 insulin um, resistance, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, how am I doing with time? This guy what? Five, all right, I'm gonna skip the, it was kind of a cool study. Well, yeah, there's obesity across the board. Uh, this was a recent paper in, in Proceedings of World Society showing in almost every domesticated animal or lab rat, lab mice that people, there's, where there's data, there's evidence for obesity in the past five decades. So, you know, they don't have vending machines, they don't have uh, overabundance of soda drinking and TV watching. Uh, some of it's probably due to, you know, we overeat and so we overfeed our animals. But even in these, these, these study animals where they've had pretty much controlled diets that haven't changed over the past five decades, the one thing that has uh, changed more so is uh, the level of pathogen exposure in, in some of these lab animals. So it's a potential idea that could be the, uh, that the standard risk factors might not be particular to the human case, but we might be seeing it elsewhere. All right, so what's going on here? Um, well, so I, I don't want to dismiss the standard risk factors. Uh, you know, low bad cholesterol, uh, low levels of obesity, high physical activity, uh, don't cigarette, don't smoke, you know, all those things probably do matter, uh, but uh, it's, it's unclear why they always matter and under what conditions they don't always matter. So the somewhat novel, a little bit more speculative area uh, that I'm trying to focus on by taking advantage of the fact that uh, the population I'm working with do have high levels of parasites uh, is that one, parasites could be mediating cholesterol levels uh, as well as obesity, uh, as I mentioned through uh, eosinophils and certain interleukines. Uh, but the parasites also, the existence leads to polarized uh, TH2 responses. Remember these were the, the helminth-based uh, arm of the immune system. And it's not just that they're having worms shifts the immune system towards Th2, it's also helping to regulate the immune system. So the idea about the hygiene hypothesis and without parasites your, your, uh, your immune system freaks out. It's not that it just freaks out, but it's that the, uh, it, the immune system gets dysregulated in a way that you're seeing more asthma, more allergies, and other autoimmune diseases. And so Partly this could be response due to low levels of, uh, even just having LDL, the bad cholesterol, in, in and of itself isn't a danger unless it gets oxidized. Uh, and if it doesn't get oxidized, then it's potentially, it's not just that it accumulates and then just blocks everything. I mean, often it has to disrupt and it has to break. And the way things cleave uh, impacts also, uh, ultimately whether or not you have a coronary or cerebrovascular event. And so, the way that LDL can get oxidized and the way that the immune system itself is implicated, I mean, I don't want to go so far as to say that cardiovascular disease is an autoimmune disease, but your own immune system is implicated uh, severely uh, in, in these kinds of coronary events and the way that the, um, the collagen content gets uh, disrupted by all these monocytes that are affecting these macrophages, kind of attacking the, the clunk uh, within the artery. And so that oxidation process has a runaway effect, much more so if your immune system is shifted towards the Th1. Uh, well, it's also another possibility. Uh, the, the, the more anti-inflammatory cytokines are protecting the vessel walls from certain injuries. So that kind of, along with this, both could be two possible reasons why uh, parasites help to be cardioprotective. Now, it's important to understand that in a lot of the populations, there's so many things varying that this is why there's no data really that exists to, to look at these kinds of things. You know, in many populations, you get rid of parasites, you clean up the water supply, you're getting immunized, you're, uh, at the same time, you're becoming more sedentary, you're eating crappier diets. Uh, so there's so many things varying simultaneously, that, which is why everyone seems to have their pet theory for what really matters in terms of, uh, chronic disease. 
All right, I'm gonna just very briefly say one or two things because I know I'm running out of, uh, I was warned. I, I, did, I did take out 15 slides because uh, I thought I had more time. Uh, but uh, just because this is really brand new and really kind of cool, uh, I'll skip that. Uh, and this is the, the, the basic kind of layman's version is pondering the possibility that if your immune system is working really hard uh, because of this uh, chronic exposure to acute infections, then to what extent is, the, is your immune system just burning out in a way, to kind of just crudely put it. And I was initially struck with this kind of interesting result about leukocytes, so your white blood cells, that uh, that's the prevalence of high leukocytes. But if you look at actual leukocyte levels, that in the, U in the U.S. they tend to be fairly flat across ages. Uh, there's some action, but not a whole lot of idea of, of of massive declines, whereas in the Chimani we saw big drops in uh, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and neutrophils. And of course just seeing circulating levels of these things, it's hard to know if, is this really a declining ability to mount a response? Is it maybe exposure is changing? And so how do you decouple the two? And so this has been the kind of much more recent stuff that I just started in the past couple months. Uh, and in order to do this, we had to move operations to our to a town uh, to set up operations, and actually now instead of us going to the Chimani, we bring the Chimani to us, and so we got a, a flow cytometer here, and uh, we're able to do some uh, fancier things that require uh, more constant electricity. You know, you don't want to zap the really really expensive machine uh, by having it hooked up to a truck battery, and so. Uh, results are starting to come in that are showing, uh, this was showing that there is, an, not only is there uh, both, well let me skip that because we got less time. Uh, when you look at, this was taking white blood cells and then stimulating them with different types of antigens. Uh, and the, the three types of antigens, it's a bacterial mitogen, lipopolysaccharide, H1N1, a virus, and then asterisks, so a helminth worm, and looking at what happens with respect to all these different cytokines. And these, I'm sorry if you can't see it, 40 to 50 years of age, 50 to 60, and 60 plus. Again, very preliminary small samples, but what we're initially seeing is that there's a decline, so these are controlled, it's the antigen exposure and looking at the ability to mount a response. And we're seeing declining ability across the board in many of these different cytokines. Now, it tends, what it looks to be the case is that the Th1-oriented cytokines are declining more rapidly than the Th2, such that you're seeing an a increasing Th2 to Th1 ratio with age. And so what that ultimately means, well, let's, let's skip that one and go, well, all right, if you have helminths, if you have helminths, we can look at what happens when we stimulate uh, your white blood cells with different types of antigens. And this was come, this idea that it's often been observed if you have worms, your ability to mount a response to a vaccine is somewhat compromised. And what we are actually seeing, so when in the H1N1 case, so if you stimulate with asterisks, it doesn't have really any effect, consistent effect that's significant. But with this stimulating with a virus or bacteria, both which require a more Th1 type response, if you're already Th2 biased, your ability to mount a response is compromised, and it's compromised particularly in the area in these Th1-based uh, cytokines, so TNF alpha, uh, IL5, IL1B, and IFN gamma. If you're, if those mean anything to you. Uh, and so the final thing I want to talk to you, show you, uh, this was just from the flow cytometry that we just did, uh, and so. Here's our 40 plus population, and we just started adding in their kids that might be 10 years of age or younger. And so, what you can see, this is the percent whether we're looking at CD4, so your helper T cells, or your CD8, your cytotoxic killer cells, T cells. Uh, so, both types of lymphocytes, if you look at the percent that are naive, so naive means they're, they're mature, but they, haven't, they don't have any specific antigen that they're keyed to, to remembering. Uh, so in other words, this is a good measure of your ability to mount a response to something new. Uh, is heavily compromised. So the cytotoxic, actually there's a decent amount of variability, even in our small sample. But certainly uh, the CD4, 
which are helping to regulate a lot of the immune system and direct everything in your immune system, uh, you hardly have very many uh, naive T cells left by the time you're 80. And so this is the kinds of things that we want to compare with other populations that have had less uh, cumulative exposure to different types of pathogens. All right, so the final conclusions, I think, uh, hopefully if I didn't go too fast, uh, that we can learn, I convinced you that you can learn a lot uh, about the aging process from populations that uh, have high pathogen burden, low energy balance, natural fertility populations, minimal health care. The Chimani exhibit very high levels of inflammation, uh, especially at young ages, uh, and this innate immune response is adaptive in high infection environments. However, it's potentially costly later in life. Uh, although it's potentially costly later in life, we actually saw in the Chimani case um, that heart disease itself seems somewhat minimal. Uh, hypertension is very low. Uh, peripheral arterial disease is absent, and there's not much evidence so far for minimal for arterial plaque. Um, a lot of population, it's not that this is totally, totally novel. People suspected for a long time that heart disease didn't exist in these kinds of populations. But part of the problem with that is, you know, you show up at a, at a place for a couple days, and if the morbidity, if the case mortality rate, fatality rate is really high, then when you have heart disease, maybe you just die. And so if you have a quick medical trip, you're unlikely to see the cases of people with really high hypertension or uh, uh, really clogged arteries and, and so uh, being able to see you know, over 10 years and having hardly any cases of actual mortality from these cases is really suggestive. And then being able to go in depth uh, with some uh, the, the fancy technology to try to verify that that's what's going on uh, inside the body is, has been really instructive. So the relationship between inflammation and vascular disease appears to be variable, may depend on exercise, adiposity, cholesterol, energy balance. Uh, the Th2 biased immune function may also be cardioprotective. Cardiovascular disease may not be an inevitable consequence of aging. Uh, and yet the immune system, aging, appears to play an important role in disease and death in high pathogen environments, and increasingly its dysregulation uh, in low pathogen environments are also being implicated. And the extent and character, of course, of immunosenescence, as I was last showing, depends on current and cumulative exposure. And so despite only the robust surviving to late ages, uh, senescence, or at least immunosenescence, uh, if, you, if I had to be pushed to make a claim, I'd say that, yeah, it does seem to be a bit more rapid in groups uh, in the Chimane and potentially, by extension, other similar types of groups. So thank you very much for, for your patience. And if I haven't gone over too much, I'm, I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you. Anyone still awake? Uh, yeah, Mark? Do you, um, are you aware of Chimane words that might describe things like heart attack, stroke, um, and uh, what do, you, could you even go so far as give them kind of literal translations? Yeah, uh, there is no single word. I mean, there's a, you know, you can, people will say topi koki, which means like literally heart exploding, and then everyone laughs because it's not, it's just that the idea of your heart exploding seems funny, but, but that's, that's the only way of conveying like that someone just kind of drops dead. And there have been cases of where people have been dropping dead uh, in the past, but I, I didn't actually get into what was being revealed by some of the echocardiographic evidence, but there is potentially some chagas in the area, and there's, uh, with other types of infections, I wouldn't say that heart disease is completely absent. But the kind of heart disease that we're most familiar with, like through atherosclerosis, I, I do believe is probably absent. So there is some evidence of you know, enlarged heart and left ventricle, ventricular hypertrophy. So it is potentially possible that you could just have heart failure uh, and someone would have dropped dead. But there's no specific word for it. And it's not even at all anything like uh, when you hear about um, places that have like uh, uh, 
where Chagas is really prevalent. Uh, there, like in, in, in Venezuela, when people play soccer, they have extra reserve players just in case one of the soccer players drops dead of a heart attack. Uh, and it's been really, you know, many cases of people leaving the hospital and as they're leaving the door, they drop dead. Uh, so through heavy, through heavy exercise, that tends to be accelerated. Uh, but there's nothing really like that in, in this kind of context. Uh, Jim? So, <clears throat> two questions. But uh, first, how long, what's the longest you've tra uh, uh, monitored any of these people? So we're, you know, having a follow-up measure yeah, yeah, yeah. has now been uh, 11 years. 11 years. So when you compare the 10-year-olds and the 50 and 80-year-olds, and so it's really cross-sectional comparisons? Yeah, so some of this, um, I didn't really show anything today that was using a lot of the, lo the longitudinal data. So like with blood pressure, it's been a kind of a bit of a combination of uh, look, with mixed models, looking at the longitudinal and the cross-sectional <coughs> together, yeah. So these could be period effects and not age effects. Uh, uh, yeah, some of them. I mean, there hasn't been massive changes in in, in the health infrastructure to to think that there's been massive uh, differences. Certainly, when you separate things out by region, which is kind of like a proxy for some cohort effects, you do see some differences here and there. Um, so, but is, which differences are you talking about in particular? Well, I mean, you had leukocyte and... Uh, yeah, that's cross-sectional. That's cross-sectional. That was all, yeah. right. But I mean, if you have a U.S., when you compare the U.S., presumably that's much more longitudinal and so forth. But anyway, that, that's fine. Well, well actually, I, no. Yeah. For the, for, I mean, some of that stuff with the flow cytometry uh -huh. is, is, is sort of a bit fancy, and so yeah. I think the only studies I've really seen, most of the stuff with flow cytometry is, all, is done with HIV patients because okay. of the T cell uh, populations being so severely affected. And so those are, those tend to be longitudinal in the sense of we look at it at time one and we look at whether they're living or dead, dead yeah. at time two, not changes in the cell populations. Okay. So the other question is, so the actuarial, you talked about the actuarial, uh, actuarial rate of aging, but sort of the baseline is 8%. And so when you say uh, the Zamani uh, aged faster, you mean 9% or 10% or is this just uh, sort of a gut feeling uh, that yeah. they age faster? Wait, where'd the, where'd the 8% come from? What was that? No, this is, is that um, the mortality rate doubling time you mean? No, no, it's 8% 8 per year in, increasing mortality rate. Oh, right, right. 30 to 85, right in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, if it was just based on the increase in mortality rate, I could say, Yes, that they're that they're uh, they're aging more rapidly. Uh, if you talk about the the just the mortality rate doubling time, I'd have to say no. But that you know even chimpanzees, when you model their mortality, are showing mortality rate doubling time. Whether it's captive or, or the wild uh, chimpanzee life tables that have been published, are showing similar uh, mortality rate doubling time. And so that's why I don't think that relying solely on the mortality rate doubling time would be the best way of assessing aging. Uh, I mean, I'm not the only one that, that, that thinks that. Um, I mean, if you, if you did believe it was just mortality rate doubling time, then you'd have to believe that uh, in the past five decades, in every European population, uh, aging has become more rapid. Yeah, no, that's it, right. But I mean, doubling time would be actuarial aging. Yeah, that's all actuarial. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Other, yes? So if I got it right, there's sort of a trade-off between, I guess it was the TH1 and TH2, and how much you put into immune function relative to macroparasites versus bacteria and viral. Mm -hmm. How did the uh, Chimani not, not end up getting uh, exposed as much to bacteria and viral agents when they were young and, and so on? Or is that not part of what seems to be going on there? Well, no, they are. Yeah, they are. They, they are mobilized as much for that, or well, uh, I mean, I I think they have. I mean, I think I didn't really. When you look at the level of all the, in fact, I didn't even realize this when I first did this. But uh, when we first looked at cytokines, it was just circulating levels of cyt of cytokines, and I was told by people, don't even bother doing that because they're so low, you won't find anything. It's below the detection level of the kits. And we actually found like two thirds of people you could detect it and quite quite noticeably. 
So the cytokines, both Th1 and Th2, were both highly elevated compared to, say, Western populations. So I didn't want to say that it's, they only have Th2 type exposures. They have all types of exposures. And in fact, it actually seems that the Th1 and that those cytokines are, are starting to uh, decline more rapidly than the Th2 ones, so that there's an increasing Th2 bias. Uh, whether that's a, an adaptive shift or not, or what the cost of mounting a Th1 versus Th2 type, I mean, these are all open questions for, for, uh, for trying to understand um, if what is going on is a best kind of investment uh, of, of resources for the kinds of exposures that people have. Or do you have a main thought on what was the trade-off there on what they have, therefore given up if they've elevated both of those? Well, certainly with TH2, with I mean, with the helmets, you, you don't really get rid of them. You just kind of keep them, they're, you know, your old friends, and, and you all, the best you can have is partial immunity. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it would make, you know, once you have partial immunity, you might only need you know some moderate level. I mean, it's 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 definitely a more constant, consistent exposure. Whereas uh, with the with viral infections, and I mean, there's some that you kind of just harbor. Like in 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 Western populations, the kinds of viral uh, infections that predict <coughs> higher inflammation and heart disease are, are like cytomegalovirus or you know mono and you know, Epstein-Barr, so, you know, these kinds of low-impact infections that don't really do much to you until you start to deteriorate in late ages. And so I think they have those, but they, then they also have just, uh, you know, virulent type uh, pneumonias and other types of, uh, uh, of, of exposures. And, I mean, I, I personally don't know enough to know the cost of mounting responses and how certainly it seems to be that the naive uh, T cells are, are are dropping pretty rapidly, and so every every year there's always like a different type of cold that you can get, and it's very different than the one yet that was around last year. And so, uh, uh, whether the payoffs of, of certain investments or you know how that plays out over time is kind of uh, still a bit hard to, to say something definitive about. And just to follow up on your thing about all that stuff with the leukocytes, we just did that and, and the plan was you know, a follow up in, in, in five years because you, know, you can only do a five year NIH but then the idea would be to have another uh, five years. So we'll, we will be able to say something uh, longitudinally on those things. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, uh -huh. um, you might expect that like being infected with a parasite would affect your nutritional levels and your growth already. So like um, are you looking at the, the growth spurt later on to correct for that? Or like what you know, are you taking that to account? Yeah, well uh, and this is where having longitudinal data would be ideal. Uh, oftentimes when you have cross sectional data and you're looking at growth, if everyone has a slightly different growth spurt, you know, it kinda gets ironed out. Uh, and, th and growth is easy to measure, so I actually do have that on uh, like 10 years worth, worth of data. Those, that curve actually, those weren't using the longitudinal yet because, sorry, that was also a little uh, preliminary. Um, but whether the timing of the growth spurt is, is shifted a little bit, uh, I mean, it does seem like that uh, there's definitely a, a, a delay towards the, the onset of the, the adolescent growth spurt, uh, and it seems to be uh, delayed more in, in men than, than in women that we've found relative, say, you know, the U.S. Uh, population. Yeah, I think, was that your whole question, or? Um, yeah, but I can talk about the rest later. Okay. Um, another thing, though, too, just in general, do you think that there's, like, what do you think is the best pathogen <laughs> That's like if you were gonna run out right now. Yeah. Well, you know there is a. There was a guy who got shut down by the FDA, um, who he actually he went to the Congo. This and he is hookworm, What's that? This is a hookworm. 
Yeah, it's just yeah. Dr. Hookworm, and you know, and there's there's numerous people like that, and they swear that. Oh, for those of you who aren't familiar with, you know, Hookworm Man, uh, you know, he had uh, what did he have? Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and there's many stories like this. Pick your, you know, asthma or allergies, so bad. Tried this medicine, tried that medication, nothing worked. Heard about, you know, parasites through some, you know, obscure study. Ran off to. Uh, couldn't get anyone to infect him with parasite. Uh, and so ran off to the Congo, went to all these villages, said, take me to your latrine. Uh, went to the latrine, took his shoes off, danced around you know, all over the place. Uh, you know, completely over-infected himself. It actually wiped out his inflammatory bowel disease, said he you know, was in heaven. But he, he did have to deworm himself because he was way over-infected. Um, but then he started, you know, cultivating his own worms. Uh, we don't need to get into the methodology. Uh, but he did sterilize them, he said, and then he was selling them over the web. And a lot of people swore by it. And there's been different versions. Uh, there's other folks who are uh, trying to find a worm that won't have any of the detrimental effects uh, in humans, but it'll have enough of the immune effects. Uh, and what I recall is it was a pig whipworm, uh, low dose, uh, that seems to be the best bet. So pig whipworm, trickerous, uh, if you had to go with one, uh, I would say, you know, if you have, you know, some autoimmune type issues, um, uh, would seem to go, but, you know, uh, it would be a hard sell, I think, you know, for people to take it might have to come in some probiotic, probiotic uh, way. But you know, even back in the 20s, uh, diet pills often had were little Ascaris eggs. Uh, I don't know if they were marketed as, you know, eat Ascaris, uh, but certainly people, you know, I try to attract students uh, to the field by saying, you know, it, you can eat all you want and you'll still lose weight. Uh, it's great. So, uh, yeah, avoid Giardia. Go with the whipworm, pig whipworm, pig whipworm, yeah. I think this is a great invitation for everybody to come to dinner. <laughs> if people would like to join us for dinner um, at the Queen of Sheba, um, and thank you very much, Mike, for that. Thank you. hypotheses of necessarily uh, uh, kin selection, also costly signaling, and really got us thinking about the dynamics of why food is shared uh, way beyond the kinship group. And this has uh, led to really the, the flourishing of literature that we see on models of cooperation, large-scale cooperation beyond kin groups um, that we read about all over the place in many ways was stimulated by the uh, really careful, painstaking, beautiful analysis that were done by uh, Mike and his colleagues in the Atche and Simani study sites. Today, however, um, he's going to talk about uh, a different string to his bow, and probably in Mike's case this is not just a, an analogy. I suspect that Mike is probably the only person in this room who I'm sure has a bow and arrow somewhere tucked away as a result of his field work. Um, and this is his work on life history, demography, and health. And um, this is a big project that he's the joint director of uh, with Hilly Kaplan on the Somali, it's called the Somali Life History Project, funded by NIH, by NIA, by NSF, and they have numerous students and um, postdocs working for them. And he's going to talk about some of this work today, specifically work on the evolution of human senescence. And finally, we took uh, Mike to the circus in Winters yesterday, and we saw fabulous stuff with people swinging all over the a big tent and the big top and doing all these wonderful tricks. And so, um, Mike, we're expecting as much of <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, that's, that's the Bolivian Michael Jackson. Uh, I figure, yeah, Monique told me yesterday that after seeing the circus that my talk has to be better than the, the equivalent of 
what was it, the spinning satellite move, you know, with the hang uh, Our best bet is to look in some of these societies that mirror some of the conditions of our ancestral past. So the, the short answer of how long do humans live under traditional conditions, uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's, I believe it's the 70s, about seven decades, uh, and I can show you a little bit of information to support that. If we take all the data that exists on exit hunter-gatherer populations, where careful demographic uh, methods have been applied to try to age people, and you can take some of that data, make some life tables, and try to look at how long people live. And so, this isn't an unbiased sample by any means, because you can only use the data that exists and that have been actively studied. So, many more are in South America than in other places. We don't have anything really from North America. Uh, but if you look at, as a whole in all these societies where you, you didn't have medical attention, you didn't have supermarkets, uh, you didn't have any other amenities of modern life, and you get a similar pattern. This is the modal age of death. So saying you survived to age 15, just look at the frequency distribution of deaths. And what you tend to find is around the, the seventh decade of life, there is a mode here. So that most people are, the majority of deaths are focused in that area. Now if you look at that yellow curve, that was actually the US from 2002. And so in more developed societies today, you see about a decade uh, difference. Uh, so that this, this modal age of death seems shifted about 10 years or so. Now interestingly, whether you look at hunter-gatherers, whether you look at uh, forager farmers, so people living like hunter-gatherers but also doing some slash and burn uh, horticulture, uh, or hunter-gatherers that have acculturated, or you can take uh, our European data, the oldest data that exists from 1751, uh, and they pretty much overlap quite a bit. I mean, there's a little bit of variability, but for the most part, they've shown similar patterns of about seven decades. Cord attached to the, the high wire and spinning around many, many times, but I might be able to break out a moonwalk if necessary, uh, <laughs> but okay. This is another reason why Facebook is dangerous. Uh, oh, that you inserted that in there. Oh, that's going to be filmed, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, um, so is age just a number? Uh, basically, you just look at these pictures. I could pick any assortment of pictures, and you can try to guess somebody's age. And oftentimes, you're right. Many times, you're wrong. This, for example, is Walt Whitman. Uh, how old does he look? Does he look 70s? Look 70s. 50s. I bet he was 50s though. 42. Yeah, yeah. so 42. Uh, and these folks are some Chimane that are uh, in their uh, 71, the guy's 71 and she's 73. Um, and so there's a lot of variability just when you look at somebody, uh, but getting more precise, you can pick your favorite biomarker, measure it over time, and you can get these individual slopes. And you can see there's a whole lot of action. Uh, this was a study done in Japan over 10 years. And you know, yeah, there's an increasing slope with age, but within each of these age categories, there's a lot of the variability. And trying to understand the variability is, is something I want to try to talk about today. And part of my take, most of the work done on humans and looking at aging is done at national level, developed societies, um, where you measure a whole bunch of biomarkers on people, maybe you follow up a year, five to five years later, uh, measure biomarkers again, see who lives, who dies. And so looking at this in the small scale society context has never really been done uh, extensively. And so trying to get a window into what health and aging might look like Hi everybody, today I have the pleasure of introducing a real star. <laughs> oh, on the left there, you see Mike Gurman, the real star, <laughs> with one of his graduate students and a celebrity. I don't know how you got Who's this. Who's a celebrity, sorry. <laughs> Mike, the real star, right? Yeah. Anyhow, it's a real pleasure to have Mike here. It's the first time he's talked at, EV, uh, at the Ecology and Evolution Seminar Series. Uh, Mike was an undergrad at Penn State, 
And then he was a graduate student at UNM, and now he's a professor at Santa Barbara at the um, Integrative Anthropological Science Program, I think they've renamed themselves. Uh, Mike has done field work both um, in Paraguay with the Ache and in Bolivia with the Simani. And I hear from his students that he is, of everybody in that team, and it's a huge team, he is by far the best Simani speaker. He also apparently knows every one of all the adults who live in 22 different <coughs> villages across Simani land. So they're all completely amazed by his abilities. Mike made his name um, early on working on issues of cooperation and food sharing. And probably many of you here don't know, but in band societies, it's very common for successful hunters to come back and give away the vast majority of their food uh, to families who are not necessarily related to them. And so this became, um, if from Mike's very detailed work, um, he was able to rule out even though they're living under very different conditions. And so if we contrast uh, hunter-gatherer, so taking the average of all our hunter-gatherer groups, uh, hunter-gatherer mortality profile uh, with, say, really good conditions like, say, the U.S. in 2004, and we can just take the ratio, and what you see is, well, first of all, the, the life expectancy at birth being about in the low 30s for hunter-gatherers, and, say, 78 for the U.S., most of you probably know this already, but it doesn't mean that everyone lives at 32 and then dies. Uh, infant and child mortality is very high, and so that average is a bit deceiving in terms of thinking about lifespan when we really think about how long do people, can they live. And so if you look at that ratio, you can see there's a huge difference early in life. So that uh, infants are about 200 times more likely to die if they're a hunter-gatherer, and it drops down pretty rapidly so that by age 15, a hunter-gatherer is about 14 times more likely to die than an American. By age 45, that number drops down to 7. And then by 65, it's still substantial, but much reduced, only three times more likely. So that there is somewhat of a convergence towards uh, almost a fixed pattern built into the life course. And so <laughs> I'm going to be going a little bit quickly because I'm excited to show you some new stuff. Uh, so my preliminary conclusions, after only giving three slides, uh, post-reproductive longevity seems to be a robust feature uh, of extant and presumably past hunter-gatherers. And not everyone believed that. This was kind of countering the idea that only in the past 150 years or so, since the advent of modern medicine, cleaning up the water supply, etc., have humans lived to fairly long lives. Uh, life expectancies for modern forager and presumably ancestral populations are low, mostly due to very high infant and child mortality. Most survival improvements with acculturation occur at young and early adult age.